I'm Ray Gator, um, probably known best uh, to uh, at least some of you as the author of Romulus, uh, My Father. Uh, and um, do I introduce you, David, or do you introduce yourself to I think you should introduce me, Ray. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, yes, um, this is one of the cases where you say this is a man who no, needs no introduction, and uh, that's true, and, and, and uh, we're here tonight uh, to discuss uh, his quarterly essay, and uh, he's written, uh, I think, an essay uh, of extraordinary range and uh, with a scholarship that's uh, impressive but not at all oppressive or obtrusive. Uh, and to the contrary, it's, it, it's a real pleasure uh, reading him, uh, reading uh, some of his beloved authors uh, in, in what looks to be a kind of uh, conversation in a community of the living and, and the dead. Uh, and uh, I'm sure nobody will be at all surprised to hear uh, me say that it's beautifully written uh, throughout. Uh, well, actually, maybe, if you wouldn't mind, we could start uh, with your reading, on the one hand, uh, the, your uh, celebration of the Rubens painting, uh, and then uh, reading uh, after that uh, the section about uh, where you write about the attitude that we now have to the body. Um, um, the, well, the, the Rubens painting is a painting he did very close to the end of his life. Uh, it's a painting of his second wife, whom he married when he was in his 50s and she was 16. And um, at the time when he painted her, she, she probably would have been 24. Uh, what my particular interest in that is that it's very, very hard for us to present uh, an image of someone in a state of real happiness. And um, this seemed to me to be something that brought us very, very close to somebody who is... Um, ecstatically happy in the world and in the flesh and with himself and he is able to make that absolutely plain to us because we have the the image in front of us but we also have him right there in the brush strokes and in the response to the image and that's useful because you know Rubens is only 13 years younger than Shakespeare and we know almost nothing about Shakespeare. And we know more about Rubens than almost anyone uh, in his age, except a few princes. And that was because he was simply so, uh, such a public figure and so well recorded. So it's amazing to see someone in this, whom we know in so many public ways, in this absolutely private moment. What makes a private work like Het, Het Pelskin so precious and rare at this point in Rubens' career, it is that we know it is his hand and the energy of his mind and body that produced every brushstroke. The painting is the product not just of his vision, his powers of composition, but of his presence, as we know him, the man himself, from other more public occasions. Is that... That's, that's great. And uh, would you mind now reading, just by contrast, um, yeah. the attitude you think we have to the body? Uh, I'm of an age which means that I've been um, around in a century when technology changed everything faster than ever before. Um, it, it's extraordinary to think that from until probably the middle of the 18th century, Nobody who was alive considered that the world they were living in was different from the world their grandfathers had lived in. Things changed so slowly that that not, would not have been perceived by someone living at any moment. Things, of course, have speeded up and speeded up till um, somebody of my age in his lifetime has seen enormous changes uh, that are almost impossible to keep up with. I'm astonished when I look back on my own childhood how little the body, as it existed in the 1930s and 1940s, resembles the body as it is today. 
They were the years before antibiotics, penicillin, when people could still die by pricking their finger on a thorn, and women in large numbers lost their lives in childbirth, when an epidemic like the Spanish flu could kill millions all around the globe in just months, and a single polio summer, such as 1947, could leave thousands of children and young adults, if they did not immediately succumb, crippled for life. A time before organ transplants, dialysis machines, heart bypasses, chemo, before the pill, before MRIs, pap smears, ultrasounds, angiograms, before liposuction, breast implants, Botox, bionic ears, and the spread throughout the community of a rigorous devotion to all the varieties of self-care. As the body became a blank sheet to be worked on and improved and decorated, diets, weights and aerobics, tattooing, waxing, piercing, the widespread phenomenon among teenagers of dental braces, and the cramming of pharmacy shelves with vitamin supplements, protein powers, and pills for maintaining friendly flora in the gut. <laughs> well, I will, we'll, um, we won't, I, I, I don't want to discuss that right now, but I do want to discuss it a little bit later. But I ask you to read it really because I thought that both passages were so uh, wonderfully written and in, and, in, and in very different tones and moods, I thought. Um, but I, I, I thought we might, we might start uh, uh, discussing uh, your beloved classical authors um, who strike me as um, a rather more varied bunch than uh, you... you um, uh, it's not that you won't allow, but, but uh, uh, there's, uh, on the one hand, someone like Plato and Socrates who are, are very intense, and uh, on the other hand, someone like uh, Aristotle... Uh, and Seneca, who were incredibly urbane, mm. uh, and are, in fact, uh, Bertrand Russell in his history of uh, Western philosophy uh, was famously unjust to Aristotle, but that was partly because he couldn't bear his urbanity, and he thought it was a man of no passion whatsoever, <laughs> uh, which I think is not entirely true, but, but uh, there's some important uh, truth in it. But I, I was struck by, by the way in which you wanted to start with, with your classical authors, because uh, it reminded me of a remark by a philosopher called Bernard Williams, uh, who uh, um, sort of uh, playing on a, a joke that had been current in Eastern Europe during the time of communism. And that joke was that uh, communism is the longest route between capitalism and capitalism. Uh, and he said that Christianity, has turned, has, it has turned out, is the longest route between paganism and paganism, mm. uh, and that now that Christianity has, no longer has the kind of influence that it has on our moral thinking that it did even, let's say, a hundred years ago, uh, we are in all sorts of ways turning back to the Greeks uh, in order to understand ourselves, not just as a scholarly historical interest. And it seems to me that's what you're doing, that I think... I, I, forgive me if, if I've got you wrong, but it seemed to me that one of the things you're saying is we will understand better uh, the attitude that we have to the body of the kind that you read out uh, um, in that second reading uh, if we understand, uh, amongst other things, the way in which they took happiness to be, as you put it, an objective condition uh, rather than as we do as a primarily subjective one. Is that right? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I suppose that is so, except that w w one of the things that I'm quite interested in and what that's what, it's what th that comes out of is that the word happiness is a very strange word in English because until about the middle of the, <clears throat> the 18th century... Um, we, w we would have thought of it in terms of its derivation. And there are words like um, happening, like uh, hapless, uh, like mishap. And all of those are words about um, material conditions. And so happiness was, uh, was, was very close to the word fortune. And so a person was happy, as when we say... Uh, it was a happy circumstance, or happily, 
this happened or didn't happen. Um, so happy really referred not to an interior state at all, but to uh, an exterior state of good fortune. And then I think they noticed that people who were fortunate um, also um, uh, I I exhibited well-being. And so the word happiness got transformed and took on the sense of well-being and of feeling well about yourself and about the world. So it was partly that contrast that led me to the difference between happiness as seen as a, um, a material, more materialistic thing uh, or, as we tend to see it, as a, as a state of mind, as a state of soul. Um, I think that um, uh, when, when we look at classical attempts to achieve happiness, I think they felt, as we probably don't, that you could be schooled uh, in that. And, you know, a lot of the classical schools, as Martha Nussbaum calls it, were, were, were places where you, you indulged in the therapy of desire, is the word she uses. But what you set out to do was free yourself of, of vulnerability to circumstance. Uh, and you detached yourself from the world. And I, I don't really think that that kind of detachment from the world, which you know you also get in, in some forms of Oriental philosophy, I don't think that is quite what we are interested in. Uh, no, certainly. <laughs> no, that's an understatement. Uh, but... Um, uh, on, uh, it's, it's true that um, it, it seems to me that the, the word eudaimonia, which is often the word used and, uh, in, in Greek, uh, could, uh, of, could, you could substitute fortunate. I mean, but we still, we still in English, uh, do, do, are able to say things like, happy is the person who, and then, and then elaborate in ways that don't necessarily refer to their subjective yeah. states or whatsoever. So we, we have no difficulty in understanding, it seems to me, someone who says, happy is the person who can go to their, to their grave. Oh, well, you could echo the uh, words of the Egyptian prayer for the dead, uh, not having made anybody weak, not having harmed yeah. anybody, etc. Mm. And, and that's a per still a perfectly familiar yeah. uh, w uh, a way of using the word happy, it, it, it seems, seems to me. And, and I don't know if I would agree that it was a purely objective state for the Greeks, because, I mean, in, certainly in the case of, let's say, someone like Aristotle, uh, being in that fortunate condition uh, was, was one uh, that, uh, it, it seemed to me, a right-thinking person would appreciate and, and take great joy in. Yeah, the, the uh, slight difficulty with it, that I have with all of that is that um, they were bound to think that because the people who were thinking about such things and certainly the people who were inhabiting those schools were privileged. They belonged to a privileged class. They were uh, men of, uh, of status. So they already had the, um, the good fortune to be able to then consider uh, what a good life might be. They had already what we think of as the good life, which means uh, the fortunate life. Uh, but not, in, not, not quite in that way, because, I mean, it, uh, for, for, for Aristotle, for example, the, 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 the good life was the virtuous life. Yeah, and and uh, it, it's certainly true uh, that to live the kind of virtuous life that he wanted, yeah. that is a life essentially... Uh, where you could do great deeds that would be admired by your peers. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting thing about about that period, actually, that, that, that uh, unlike a post-Christian world, uh, they thought that people could, without shame whatsoever, live in the deserved esteem of their peers yes. and, and, ba yeah. and bask in it. Uh, so it's not just an accidental connection that it was external good fortune and a, a sense of well-being essential to the idea, I, th I think, as they thought it, saw, thought it uh, was that a person who saw clearly the kind of life she was living would take great pleasure and even joy in, in it. Yeah, it's interesting that towards... Uh, you, when you were speaking before about uh, why I was interested in 
particularly the later classical world, uh, and why it seems particularly useful to us, is it seems to me that if you look at that period, say from the accession of Trajan through to the death of Marcus Aurelius, I mean, that is absolutely a golden period in which um, uh, the empire was mostly at peace, except for a few wars on the edge, uh, where um, the state was extraordinarily well run, where um, they had begun to realise that one of the things that made it possible for you to uh, run a, a decent state was that you had to have the economy in order. Uh, They also realised that one of the things that made it a decent state was you had to start uh, giving citizenship and equality to all sorts of people. So um, uh, Roman citizenship was extended to almost everybody in the empire as long as they were willing to um, swear certain kinds of things. Rights were extended in an enormously interesting way to women. Um, And that is the time when, for example, one of the greatest of the philosophers in the schools is an ex-slave. That's Epictetus. Um, So it seems to me that that is a period when we look back, which is something which is concerned with something like the same things that we're concerned with. How do you hold a big state together how do you manage an economy? Uh, how do you see that justice begins to work uh, in the state? And it's also the time when people are taking on um, literary and philosophical questions which are very like ours. Now, the 19th century generally saw all of that as merely decadent. Yeah. Uh, we've begun to see it not as decadent at all because we understand it from inside. And that's a period that I'm particularly interested in. And, you know, I didn't mention somebody who in that period would would be perhaps my favourite of all those classical writers, and that's Plutarch. Well, I I will keep keeping on on the political theme uh, that you touched, and and this is something we talked about uh, on the phone, and I'm I'm interested in following through. Uh, It it has to do with, with, with a suspicion I have that that the things that you talk about and, 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 and give us great insight into, uh, that the concept of happiness is not adequate to them, actually. That, that it, uh, uh, and, and so let, let me start off with, 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 uh, with uh, the, the idea of the pursuit of the greatest happiness, of, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the pursuit of the greatest happiness for the greatest number, which was mm-hmm. um, uh, a theme of utilitarianism, of course. An Australian philosopher, uh, Jack Smart, once said, when, 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 as always happens when people discuss, well, what is happiness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he said, look, what's really at issue here is the alleviation of misery. Yes. That is the alleviation of misery. Yeah. Uh, and he said the really driving force uh, for, for the, these philosophers, the utilitarian philosophers, who talk so often about the greatest happiness of the greatest number, the, the really driving force was compassion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, Jack Smart said, or Bentham said at one stage, uh, the, the founder of utilitarianism said, "Don't ask whether it thinks; ask whether it suffers." That that's the important thought. And in this connection, if you connect with the crimes that you are talking about that these people, uh, in in one way or another, instigated, I'm reminded again of Hannah Arendt, who who talked about, uh, she called it the passion of. Just talking about Robespierre, actually talk. Uh, the passion of compassion, which she said had a capacity for cruelty uh, greater than cruelty itself. Uh, And uh, she instanced in another connection a modern writer, Brecht, who said, uh, uh, thinking of Stalin, supporting Stalin, said, sink down into the slime, embrace the butcher, but change the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm wondering there whether, though, though the slogan constantly was the greatest happiness, the greatest number, and the pursuit of happiness, and so on. Whether the real work concepts that were doing the work was the allevi- a compassionate need to alleviate misery. Well, I think that even when Jefferson uh, first said, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is really the beginning of all of that uh, notion that uh, happiness might be one of the rights that everyone would have, 
uh, he would have been thinking in 18th century terms where um, happiness was ec- exactly that, the absence of the conditions of misery. And so if you thought of that as a project, and uh, that would mean the removal of things like um, uh, uh, injustice, homelessness, um, unemployment, uh, starvation, um, inequality under the law. They are all the things which are things you can legislate for. And you, and you do all of that. That's part of the project of making people universally happy. But it's, and that is in some ways what we have achieved. We'd have to say when we look around that we're well-housed, well-fed, well-clothed. Um, we don't have to worry about famines any longer. We don't have to worry about pestilence. That is exactly the point at which you have done everything you possibly can to make people not miserable. That is the point at which they must learn now to be positively happy. And that's the problem. (laughs) And the question I ask is, why, when we are living in a state where, for most of us, certainly in the society we live in, and there's not the whole world, of course, um, all the things that might make us miserable have been removed, why are we still in a state of anxiety, uh, stress, Why do we feel we have not got what we really wanted? Uh, Why in a world where um, excess is the norm do we keep feeling that there is more and we haven't got it? That's that's really in, in some ways where I begin because people in the past would have looked at the world we're living in and say, these people have achieved paradise. Um, they're, 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 they're living li- the lives of angels. Why don't we feel like that? But think, thinking, thinking less practically, they might say, as, as a, a, the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl uh, wrote, uh, he said that, that what he had discovered uh, in his uh, therapeutic practice was that what people really sought was not happiness but meaning in their lives. Mm. And, and that's why I, that's why I raised, raised this big question over us. Uh, over this conversation, whether happiness is the concept that you really want to explore why it is that we're so anxious, discontented, or, or as you put it, restless. Yeah, well, I, I suppose what I'm thinking of is in, in terms of that Jeffersonian project, if that's what he actually had in mind, that the idea was that, that you provided people with, uh, by removing all of those things, with the conditions of happiness, for, for being happy, for pursuing happiness. And, but perhaps those are not really the necessary conditions at all of, of happiness. And that if, um, if happiness is a, is, a, is a belief that you are um, uh, at, at one with the world you live in and with yourself and with your neighbours. <clears throat> and that would be one of the ways in which one might define happiness. Um, those conditions really in the end, even when they've been achieved, have nothing to do with it. So the question is, what is it that we have um, achieved along the way that makes life difficult for us. There are other conditions now, and what are those conditions that make us, as I said, anxious, unsafe, powerless, whatever it is? Well, I think one, if, if, if I understand you, I think, I think one, one answer that you give is that we're now, despite that concern for the body that, that you um, read out before, uh, they're all, they're, there's a very deep way in which we're alienated from the body because uh, the concern for it has become uh, mindless uh, in the literal sense, sorry, more or less in the literal sense of the word because we now so... The, the concept of the mind as distinct from the brain, for example, is becoming very attenuated for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, people actually say things like, uh, my brain thinks that such and such, or it's my brain that feel, it, my brain feels that <clears throat> such and such, rather than I think so and so, or I feel such and such. 
And so, so in, in that sense, I, 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 if I've understood you, you, want, you wanted to say that there have been all sorts of developments, both in science and in technology, that are alienating us from, uh, from a, a, a deeply intimate relationship to our bodies. Yeah. That is, that is, is, is that right? Yeah, I, I've got some sort of idea that uh, um, our relationship to our body and our body's relationship to the world is a lot more primitive still than the rest of what we have created. And that is that... Um, and that's why I go back to that idea, that uh, Greek idea from Protagoras, that, that man is the measure of all things, but everything both begins and ends in a kind of way with what is within the body's reach. Uh, and I, I think back to, for example, when I... Uh, 25 years ago now, I went to live in a village in Italy. And I was living for the very first time with people in 1978 uh, who might still have been in 1378 or even 378. Um, and what I mean by that is they were highly sophisticated people. This was Tuscany. Um, I, I realised, first of all, that although I was in the one of the great centres of Christendom, these people were not Christians and never really had been. Um, they were, in fact, pagans. What they worshipped was the olive trees, and um, what, what sacrament meant for them was sitting down each day at lunch with, with the family, and, and this is where the, the idea of the sacrament comes from, you know, sitting at a table and eating the food that they'd grown. The, there was that. Most of them had never been more than 10 kilometres from the village, which was the place where they had, had been born. They looked at the little village on the, that was on the hill opposite as if it were the other side of Mars. Um, and I realised that if you lived like that, and these people were living, that huge numbers of the people still on the planet lived that way, and that it's not really all that long ago that we lived that way too. And I, again, coming back to live in Sydney, I, I really also realised that one of the things I did, because I don't have a car, and because I um, don't have to commute to work, was that in fact, well, although I lived in a big city, I really lived in about two kilometres. In, in, in any direction. That's how far I went any day and any week. And I think, perhaps, that that is how we feel most comfortable. But we've created a world in which our mind lives somewhere quite different from that. And technology has made it um, so that we now have this enormous um, grasp of things. We can actually look at our own planet on a screen and see ourselves out there in space somewhere. <clears throat> we know how far we can look into the universe and it's, re it's, it's millions and millions of light <clears throat> years away. Or we can also look on a screen inside ourselves, as I did the other night on television, and watch a malaria virus invading a human cell. So, you know, we've got this, this enormous reach of the mind, we were still left with the same body. And maybe the body still n thinks in the same kind of way about what it is comfortable with. And I think that's a source of real anxiety to us. Well, I, I have a sense that many, many people now are very open, open to the thought uh, that the, the, the body is merely the means which we have thus far been able to do things. It's, been an, it's essentially been an instrument. And uh, uh, they think, well, look, um, the, uh, thoughts are brain processes, as, as things stand. Uh, and they think if you believe that, that is, if you think there are no immaterial substances or immaterial events, then one thing you should recognise is, is that there are other things that could, could be producing the thoughts other than the stuff that's actually in the brain. It could be the stuff that goes into computers, for example. 
uh, because if all that matters is that the brain is what enables you to think and have sensations, etc., etc., why couldn't some why couldn't we do that in some other material form? Mm. And I, th I I have a feeling that this is this this thought. Uh, is, uh, has captured not just the imaginations of philosophy students in King's College London. Because I, 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 I told you on, on the telephone, I, I spoke once with a man who makes robots. This was a, at Adelaide, the Festival of Ideas at MIT. And he said the really interesting question is not when we will be able to make them like us. When will we, when will we make ourselves like them? And you just have to extend the thought. You have plastic hips, you have this. We hope that when someone's in an accident, they're brain damaged, that we can replace those parts that will enable them to remember, to think, etc. Not necessarily in flesh and blood. So here that seems to me that there's now, it's, it's not just science fiction, but there, there is a, a really imaginative sense that the body, that the, the flesh and bl blood body was only the means by which we, are, we, we human beings, the species Homo sapiens, has thus far been able to think, etc., etc., and have sensations, uh, sexual sensations, which presumably could be stimulated in some other sort of ways. I, 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 I know this sounds gr gr grotesque, but... Uh, but uh, uh, well, no, look, I'm, you... I'm, I'm prepared to admit that we are very, very flexible creatures, and that... Um, we may evolve all sorts of ways uh, and eventually feel comfortable with all of that. But I just wonder whether what you're describing is something that most of us feel is enlarging and enlivening or whether it seems um, threatening. Well I, think, well, I think the people I'm describing think that, that uh, we're scared of it at the moment, but we ought to be open to it being enlarging. Because they say, that's just how it is. This is some, they say, this is something we have now learned about the body. Yeah. It is, in principle, dispensable. But, well, it does really raise the question, which I wanted to raise in the essay altogether, whether um, the, the pace of technology and the momentum with which these things are happening are ones that we can actually keep up with. And I, I think that's one of the things that makes us uh, fearful. We're excited by the technology and we throw ourselves into using it, um, but we also somewhere, when we lie down to sleep or in our dreams or somewhere else, we, we are still that heavy-boned, um, creature who can't see more than, you know, 150 feet and can't move faster than than four kilometres an hour or something, what it is, what it is when we're walking. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm with you entirely <laughs> on this, you see. But, 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 but the, the question then is, is, is who's the we? Did you think yeah, exactly. And, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. and, you know, I just say I'm open to the idea, and I again say there in the, in the essay that um, it's, not a, it's not for me or my generation to be able to grasp what a new generation is going to be able to deal with. But the question is there, and for, for me, um, it's scary. I, I, think, I think a lot of people think that it is... Uh, 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 you know, I, I, I think there's one conception that thinks that it's somehow utterly essential to our sense of what is to be human, that we're mortal beings, mm. vulnerable to suffering, vulnerable mm. to misfortune, on the one hand. And there are people who say, yes, we happen to be such beings, but maybe technology will change that. And it's no, in no sense part, it shouldn't be, these people will say, shouldn't be in any sense part of our self-definition. Mm. I wonder how old these people are. <laughs> I mean, why I say that, why I say that is it's true, and we know it's true, that young men, for example, are incapable of fully conceiving the idea that they're going to die. And that's why they take terrible risks and why they go off to wars and things. Eventually, we come to believe in our own mortality, not because um, uh, somebody 
convince us of it in argument, but because when we get to a certain age, we have bodies which t- keep telling us this bit is dying. <laughs> you know, this bit is, is no longer functions as it once did. And that's, it, it happens slowly, and, uh, but it's pretty convincing. <laughs> And it's the body that tells us that. We don't learn it from, even from, uh, uh, you know, what's happened to others. That's not convincing. But, but you see, the person who, uh, who was described as seriously intending not to die knows that only too well. That's why he seriously <laughs> intends not to die. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, the, the, I, I do think, this, I think there are, there, there are hmm. two, two very different attitudes here. One is that, that thinks it's somehow essential to the human condition that we're mortal beings. Hmm. Uh, the other that says, regretfully, it happens to be how things are with us. Hmm. Let's hope that, hope that they might change. And these, these seem to me radically different perspectives. Mm. And the second perspective has taken on some kind of reality in people's imaginations because they think technology can do marvels. Yeah. I mean, that's such a radical and new idea, though, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I, I, in the essay, I talk about uh, Condorcet, you know, who really was the first person to come up with the notion that um, progress was what everything was all about and, and that man was in the end perfectible. Again, a pretty, um, I mean, but this is, the, this is to go absolutely beyond that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'd be interested to see if there are people in the audience who feel, that, feel this is now part of mm. people serious, serious, serious imagining of the human condition or whether it's, it's a kind of fanciful piece of science fiction. Mm. But, it, but, it, but if, if I'm right, then it involves a radically altered sense of the human oh, condition. Yeah. And, and to take up your point, it's hard to see how people who really th- think that could see themselves in the mirror of our inheritance, who could, mm. who, who could seriously respond to all that's great in our art. And in fact, serious, it's hard to see how they could seriously respond to what's been so deeply moving to us in mm. scientific and technological aspiration. Mm. That, that, I think we're being... Isn't that last issue you brought up about um, people um, knowing that they're or thinking they're not going to die, just going back in a different way and thinking of the religious idea of life after death? Well, I'm not quite sure of that I, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things around at the beginning of the 20th century that were already considering um, the horrors or the opposite, of, uh, of a prolonged human life. I'm thinking of things like, like Bernard Shaw's Man and Superman and things like that, for example. Um, but, you know, what Ray is suggesting is that this is now a real possibility. In and people's it, minds. Yes, and it's not... But I think it's very different from the life after death thing because the life after death thing really meant, certainly in the Christian world, that... Um, uh, there was a life which would make up for the fact that your life here had been utterly, utterly miserable. Uh, and there, that, that was going to be um, justified at last, except that it had a pretty terrible kind of couple of tags to it, which, again, I suggest. One is, uh, if either through faith or good works, you were going to be saved. You were going to have a great time. But most people were going to end up, uh, first of all, in purgatory, and then perhaps in hell. And uh, maybe maybe this is a little better than that. (laughs) I wanted to ask you if your ideas, it seems to me that your ideas have changed a bit. Um, I just finished reading An Imaginary Life, which you wrote in 1978. And in in that one, if you haven't read it, it's about Ovid and how he's been exiled on Thomas. And he's a bit of a playboy and he's having a hard time adapting. Um, And it seems to me, because he's deprived of his language and his poetry, um, and therefore because of his sense of self, 
And in the novel he learns to take joy in small things like a scarlet flower that he sees and to transcend the limitations of that kind of life and belong in a more confined natural environment. So for him the metamorphosis involves being at one in his environment and reconciling his memories and not so much to do with the body. Um, am I, is, have I interpreted that as you would? Uh, oh, that's quite difficult to say. Uh, look, I think I was interested there in something which, um, again, interests me very much about that classical world, and that is um, something which at that time in the 70s was around, I think, as, a, as, a, as, as an idea in a different form, and that is some kind of um, notion of creation as a whole, so that you could um, uh, you could actually go up what the um, the Elizabethans would have called the great ladder of being. That is that that, that all the creatures, um, all the created things, were in some kind of way related to a, to one another in a kind of hierarchy, and that. Uh, if you, if you started being a man, you could, in fact, develop into uh, a godlike creature. Um, if I ever believed that when I was writing it, and um, I don't think Ovid ever himself believed the whole of the meta metamorphosis idea, it, it, I, I, I certainly don't believe it now. <laughs> Uh, it, it's still a wonderful fable. Uh, and, you know, what I keep wanting to say is that those kind of fables, are, again, I use one of them in the essay, those kind of fables are ways that enable us to think about what it means to be human rather than um, either scientific things that we have to believe are true or things that we have to believe in in theological terms are true. And that's very much a kind of um, classical way of proceeding, I think. I think the, the provisional for them as a way of, uh, of truth, as a way of thinking, is something that we, we use, but not in quite the same way that they do. I was being provisional, I think. <laughs> But when I was reading Ransom, I had a feeling that you had read around the cognitive sciences, um, that you had read around the cognitive sciences during your life and, you know, spoken about them, and that in part you were saying how far we have come to some extent by, you know, perhaps accepting chance, accepting things that we... We now know that we only are able to perceive so much because of the way we are made. And that you might have been saying, this is how far we've come, but we're really still kind of there. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, in a lot of what I write, um, I, I keep coming back to things which are contradictory. One is how extraordinarily we have changed the world that we live in, and yet how uh, much we ourselves are still stuck somewhere, um, which means that if we were projected backwards rather than forwards, um, we would actually find that the world we were in was more, uh, more difficult, but we would recognise still very, very much that these are people who... Uh, like us, and you know that's what you do when you when you um, when you write a book that's set you know two and a half thousand years ago, and ask people to uh, identify with the characters as characters that they can understand, while at the same time recognizing the fact that we live in a, a, a world so different from theirs. And it's not just that some things remain; it is that somewhere in us. Um, whether it's, as I say, when we're asleep and dreaming or, or whenever, um, we are still creatures that belong in a, uh, a world that is not the world we have made here.
Um, well, I, we're wrapping it up uh, with that, I'm afraid. I, I, I would ask you to thank um, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.